Bet, say no more. DNA from a space virus mutated and became a Pokemon. It appears where Auroras are seen. You know, I can't think of a better way to start off a video in a time like this than with Deoxys, the coronavirus Pokemon. Viruses are essentially non-living packages of genetic information. What they do is infiltrate a host cell and take advantage of its cellular machinery in order to replicate this genetic information and create copies of itself. Sometimes though, when things are getting hot, you feel me? White blood cells are out, lurking, trying to lock a virus up. The virus can lay low and incorporate its DNA into the host genome so that it can continue to replicate itself at a later date. In a sci-fi type universe, I can totally buy the prospect of some alien civilization sending over a virus containing DNA that has the instructions for generating Deoxys following several generations of cell division. Again, it's a little bit of a stretch, but I want to give my man right here a little bit of a pass. We underestimated a virus not too long ago and uh, I don't think we should make that mistake again. Capable of copying an enemy's genetic code to instantly transform itself into a duplicate of the enemy. So first, Ditto's gonna have to instantaneously sequence the entire genome of the organisms he's interested in replicating. With the speed that it's all happening, it'll likely have to be some type of spectroscopic phenomenon, meaning that Ditto is sending out an electromagnetic signal of some sort. The signal would have to interact with the DNA in one of the target cells, and then the DNA would have to return a signal that is dependent on the specific combinations of A's, T's, C's, and G's present in every chromosome that organism possesses. So then the signal then has to be decoded by Ditto in some way, so he'd need an organ with some sort of detector, similar to the rods and cones in your eyes that create an image based on light reflected by objects in the environment. Ditto would then have to synthesize all the base pairs present in the target organism, He'd also have to be photosynthetic in order to convert carbon dioxide in the air into biomass instantaneously in order to grow as necessary. Now, at this point, we're already far beyond the capabilities of any mechanisms that exist on our planet. It becomes very complicated very fast. That's sheer insanity. I'm out. To protect its trainer, it will expand all its psychic power to create a small black hole. Alright, so Sloan Walker asks a really good question here about the force required to perform this task. So force is obviously going to play a role here, but I'd argue we don't even have to go that far. What we really care about here is mass. So you may have heard of the term escape velocity. We know if we throw a ball in the air, the ball will be pulled back to the Earth's surface by gravity. The question of escape velocity is how fast would the ball have to be traveling when it leaves my hand in order to escape the pull of Earth's gravity and continue traveling. This escape velocity is different on different bodies. For example, it's about 25,000 miles per hour on Earth, but about 130,000 miles per hour on Jupiter. This is because Jupiter has more mass than the Earth and therefore gravity is stronger on Jupiter's surface. Back to black holes though. In order to be a black hole, an object has to be so massive that the velocity required to escape its gravitational pull is greater than the speed of light. This means light that would otherwise reflect off the object and travel to our eyes so we can see it is instead pulled in. So, in order for Gardevoir to create a black hole, it would need to concentrate a tremendous amount of mass. How much mass? Well, this very popular image from last year shows a black hole with a mass 6.5 billion times the mass of the sun. In Gardevoir's defense, the smaller the black hole, the less mass is required. So if we were to assume it can create a very small black hole of about a meter in diameter, Gardevoir would still need to concentrate the mass of about 56 Earths. So yeah, this is not very likely to have ever occurred, even in the Pokemon universe. Dustclops' body is completely hollow. There's nothing at all inside. It is said that its body is like a black hole. This Pokemon will absorb anything into its body, but nothing will ever come back out. So, more black holes. Based on our previous entry, you can probably already tell that this doesn't make so much sense. There are these conflicting ideas about its body being completely empty, but at the same time being dense enough to be a black hole. As we just discussed, generating a black hole needs a lot of mass or a lot of stuff in the same place. So these ideas are conflicting and so this drawing kind of trash bro, sorry. Hard 
From the food it digests, it generates electricity and stores this electricity in its electric sack. Alright, so we've seen this many times before in this channel, but in case you're new, let's very quickly go over it again. We eat food in order to supply energy to our bodies. The energy of this food is not either used to perform our normal bodily functions such as moving and thinking, or it gets stored in some fashion. A common example would be as fat, such that it can enable these things such as moving and thinking at a later date. I would say it's equally as possible for an electric Pokemon like this to spend some of that energy creating a charge imbalance that can later be used to generate electricity similar to a battery, which this Pokemon is based on. So good job here, Game Freak. Swallow. It gulps anything that it fits in its mouth. Its special enzymes can dissolve anything. Okay, so enzymes do a lot of things. Basically, all the chemistry that happens in your body is catalyzed by enzymes. There are many classes of enzymes, though, that are good at breaking down large organic molecules. I'm not quite familiar with any enzymes that act on inorganic matter, but that's fine. I could totally buy that if this Pokemon was never able to develop a consistent diet based on a variety of similar foods, um, that it would never evolve a lot of very specific digestive enzymes, which are only good at breaking down certain types of molecules. These more promiscuous enzymes could certainly evolve over time though in order to ensure that this Pokemon can generate energy from any organic matter, regardless of what food it finds to eat. Hand in hand with that, it builds up these immunities that other Pokemon won't. So over time, this Pokemon becomes poisonous to others because it's used to consuming things and accordingly generating certain metabolites that would be potentially harmful to other Pokemon. Toxin. It manipulates the chemical makeup of its poison to produce electricity. The voltage is weak, but it can cause a tingling paralysis. Alright, so this little guy is kind of like a combination of the previous two. This could be an interesting little exercise. Feel free to rewind slash pause if you have to and take a second to try to figure out the science that would be necessary in order for this to be possible. Let me know what you guys come up with in the comments down below. Arter. Because of its ability to slip through block walls, it is said to be from another dimension. I would say this is one of the better uses of the term dimension that I've seen in popular culture. There's a really interesting Carl Sagan video that explains this very well. I'll link to it in the description. Let's try to conceptualize one dimensional space. That is existence only on a line. So if only one dimension exists, then you can move back and forth on this line, but nowhere else. Because again, there's only one dimension, like X. So let's let this red dot on this line represent a girl who very appropriately is named Dot. She lives in this one dimensional reality. Now, if Dot wants to travel from her current position to this one here, she has to travel on this line. If we put some sort of blockade in between her and her destination, she's no longer able to reach it. But hypothetically, if a dot version of Haunter existed in this one dimensional reality, he would be able to transcend dimensions, taking this path instead. While he was above the line here, according to everyone living in this one dimensional space, he would have completely disappeared. Seconds later, he would have reappeared on the other side. You can continue to perform this thought exercise where you conceptualize one dimension greater than the reality's dimensional existence in order to essentially teleport through that dimensional existence. I'm not sure that we fully understand how this would work, traveling through a fourth dimension in order to slip through walls in three dimensional space, but it's clear that Haunter has already figured it out. Giratina. Pokemon that is said to live in a world on the reverse side of ours. It appears in an ancient cemetery. All right, so this is very similar to Haunter. And if you really conceptualize this, it's very chilling to think about. Let's go back to our one dimensional reality real quick. So Dot exists in this one dimensional space. For all she knows, there could be an infinite amount of one dimensional realities, identical or non-identical to hers, existing in parallel. Thinking about this in 3D, Giratina's distortion world, or for example, the upside down from Stranger Things, could be one of these other realities. An interdimensional portal like this one here would allow travel via a higher dimension between Dot's world and these others. This would allow people or creatures from one reality to travel to another. It's really, really freaky, but hypothetically, it's possible. It fires arrow quills from its wings with such precision that they can pierce a pebble at distances over 100 yards. So I'd make the argument that this is actually more about accuracy than it is about precision. Right, because he's very accurately hitting the target at which he's aiming. So accuracy has to do with how far you are from a true value, whereas precision has to do with how close each attempt is to each other. So the Decidueye can actually be very precise, yet very inaccurate. If he takes three attempts, each of which are very far from the target at which he was aiming, but are each very close one to another. Alright, so there you go, accuracy versus precision. 
All right, and that's all there is for today. All right, so definitely if you enjoyed that, do me a favor real quick. Stop what you're doing and then like and subscribe. Next, I need you to pick your phone up, go to Instagram real quick, type in at Fresh Professor, and then follow me on that joint too. All right, cool. Also, if I did not get to your Pokemon in this video, it's not personal. Trust me. Um, I obviously can't address every Pokemon in one video, and I also have to choose them such that, you know, we can talk about a couple different topics each time. And so I definitely, again, intend to get to every single one of the requested Pokemon. So if there's a Pokemon that you'd like to see, definitely drop it down in the comments below. Even if you mentioned it in one of the previous videos, you would increase the chances of me getting to it if you drop it down in the comments of this video as well. So get to it. Thank you again for watching, guys. I will see you in the next one.